Hello, I'm Renee San Miguel with the Georgia Tech College of Sciences. By now you may have learned that College of Sciences Dean Paul Goldbart has accepted a position to be the next Dean of the College of Natural Sciences in the University of Texas at Austin. The Lone Star State's gain is our loss. We are sad to see Paul go, and we thank him for his extraordinary service to the College of Sciences and to Georgia Tech. I interviewed Paul in early 2018 for the premiere episode of the College of Sciences podcast called Science Matters. With the new appointment in Texas, however, we've recast the interview into a two-part audio story to serve as a valedictory for Paul, as well as a preview of Science Matters, which will begin broadcasting in summer 2018. Here is Dean Paul Goldbart in his own words, and you can hear him as both engaging physics professor and forward-thinking administrator as he charts opportunities for growth of the Georgia Tech College of Sciences and recalls the highlights of his tenure. So let me uh, begin with astrobiology. Mm -hmm. uh, once upon a time, that title sounded like a crank science. Uh, it's really moved to center stage now, incredibly exciting. So we have uh, folks really thinking about how to search for life in space and in time, looking out into the cosmos. Wouldn't it be remarkable to find out where, uh, where our neighboring uh, colonies of life are? Mm -hmm. And we have communities looking at that from uh, the aspects of biology and chemistry, from earth and atmospheric sciences and physics. Uh, we have people thinking about exoplanets, how you find and discover the properties of planets orbiting other stars. So a tremendous range and tremendous interdisciplinarity. We also have folks who are looking back in time. How did uh, life start here on Earth? Wonderful uh, activities in chemistry, earth and atmospheric science and biology, uh, looking at this tiny thin sliver of, of uh, shell mm -hmm. of life here on our uh, remarkable planet and people essentially doing the archeology span of the oceans. What was the chemical composition of the oceans back in time? Was there enough, was there enough oxygen to sustain life? folks working on that kind of uh, really fundamental and uh, incredibly exciting question. So astrobiology is really central and we have a thriving community and it reaches out well beyond the College of Sciences, interacting with folks in uh, the Ivan Allen College of the uh, Humanities, mm -hmm. wonderful community there and elsewhere on campus too. So uh, delighted to see that here at Georgia Tech. Let me turn to another area in the life sciences that I'm very excited about, uh, the area of microbial ecology. There are microbes everywhere, all around us, and we live in this uh, hopefully symbiotic relationship with them. And the study of uh, microbial ecology is really taking shape uh, quite wonderfully here with an emerging uh, community of people from, uh, from biological sciences, uh, from chemistry, and from physics. And this subject needs tools all the way from, uh, from genetics and uh, biology, uh, through, uh, through game theory, uh, physics and mathematics, all the way into medicine. So just to give you a flavor of the subject, uh, how uh, microbes and microbial infections infect us, uh, harm us, it's really a question of the shape and structure of the colonies that they form. And so physicists are teaming up uh, with biologists to understand the kind of materials that form through microbial infections. And this is taking us all the way from basic science through to wound care and all the way to, uh, to healthcare and cystic fibrosis. So I must say, from my perspective, it's incredibly exciting to see science, both at the fundamental level, but also reaching out into the community. And, yeah, and so many that. applications for, for what is being uh, researched here. You know, as we, as we have this conversation, we're going through one of the worst flu epidemics uh, that the country has seen in a, in a long time. And, uh, but, but there are so many things that this would be applied to uh, you know, to warfare and, and, and treating wounds in battlefield, things like that. Uh, it's just very exciting research. That's right. And, and uh, healthcare within hospitals, microbial infections arise in hospitals at an enormous rate. And so what's so exciting is to look at this long arc of history and feel that we are the tip of the spear, uh, the, the spear currently in uh, developing new knowledge and understanding to inform the healthcare of the future. And that's a, that's a remarkable, remarkable place to be. Let's talk about the eclipse. On August 21st, 2017, the first day of classes, thousands of members of the Georgia Tech community descended on Tech Green to watch the moon's shadow cover 97% of the afternoon sun. I will always remember this because I saw the eclipse and started college on the same day at the best university. College of Sciences, along with the provost's office, put together uh, a quite exquisite array of activities 
those of you who live in the uh, southeast might know of Woodstock, Georgia. Uh, this was a different kind of Woodstock. This was a <laughs> remarkable event on campus. We had thousands and thousands of people coming together, congregating, all inspired by an eclipse. And eclipses, of course, go back in history, and they've had uh, uh, quite interesting uh, sociological impact, uh, uh, ushering in new eras and, and so forth. And so to watch our community come and react, our community of scientists and mathematicians and technologists and engineers and others come together but react in this wonderfully human way and enjoy this uh, remarkable uh, uh, astro astronomical event was, was really wonderful. And so just to see the community out there with this uh, with this festival atmosphere was was great and then the only concern really is what are we going to do next year <laughs> uh, it was a, really it was a marvelous time tell me about gravitational waves i mean the the, the idea of the of the uh, institute and some of the faculty and the researchers and, and students here involved it would eventually be a Nobel Prize winning effort uh, had to had to be just so pleasing for you. Well, this is very exciting. So I've been at Georgia Tech for about seven years and uh, astrophysics uh, was uh, launched here a little bit before I arrived and has really taken root quite beautifully with uh, with wonderful leadership, uh, initially from Pablo Laguna and now from Deirdre Shoemaker. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about the story because the story really goes back now a little bit over a hundred years. Albert Einstein has put together his masterpiece theory of what's called general relativity, which is really the first successful post-Newtonian understanding of gravity. And the remarkable shift in thinking that came about with Einstein in 1915 was the idea that space and time themselves have a kind of pliability or elasticity to them. They're not just a rigid stage on which the uh, history of the universe unfolds, but they are in their motions and changes part of that story. They are actually actors, not just the stage. And one of the predictions uh, goes something like this. Uh, if uh, you, you may know that if you shake an electrical charge, out comes electromagnetic radiation. That, for example, is how when you heat an atom, uh, it puffs off a little bit of light. Uh, that's where we get yeah, the yellow of sodium lamps, for example. So shaking charges electrical charges cause, causes a ripple in the electromagnetic field that propagates outward and that's what we call light or in other frequencies different forms of radiation like x-rays mm -hmm. or infrared radiation just to give two examples. Uh, after, after Einstein in 1915 we understood that the same kind of thing happens with mass. If you shake some mass somewhere in the universe that mass actually causes a ripple but now the ripple is not in the electromagnetic field, but it's in space and time, the actual geometry of space and time themselves. And that ripple propagates out, and it takes a certain amount of time to arrive uh, at, uh, at a distance. So, for example, if the sun were to magically disappear, uh, we wouldn't know it for the eight or so minutes that it would take for the gravitational field to change and respond to a new configuration, the one that would be there in the absence of the sun, mm -hmm. at which time the planet uh, Earth would fly off in a kind of tangential uh, trajectory rather than its almost circular orbit. So the basic idea is that uh, masses, when they um, move and they accelerate, they can give rise to a uh, rippling in space and time that propagates like a wave, like the, like the ripples that you find on the surface of a pond when you throw a stone in. Mm -hmm. Uh, the tough part of the story is that space and time are remarkably stiff mm -hmm. and so it takes very big masses to have a perceptible and measurable impact and where can you find big masses accelerating quickly well you can find them in the mergers of black holes so i remind you that black holes are stars that uh, have collapsed under uh, gravity uh, so much so that uh, not even light uh, essentially not even light can escape from them that's why they're black mm -hmm. Uh, they're very, very dense objects, and they uh, can come in occasionally in pairs, and they orbit around uh, one another in the same way, r roughly speaking, that the uh, moon orbits around the Earth. Now, what happens is that these two black holes are, are moving around one another, and uh, because of this idea of uh, space and time having a kind of elasticity to them, 
uh, that binary black hole system radiates out energy in the form of gravitational waves and just a little bit like the yolks of two f eggs frying in a frying pan, they m move around one another and eventually in this cataclysmic event they merge into a single yolk. Here they merge into a single black hole and as they do, they give out an astonishing amount of energy mm -hmm. in the form of gravitational radiation, which then propagates through the cosmos, and that's that, that's the way it goes until LIGO. <laughs> and LIGO is this uh, experiment, uh, this uh, collaboration, roughly a thousand people working uh, hand in glove, uh, two stations, uh, Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana, uh, and there are experiments at both sites. Um, and uh, the reason there are two sites is that uh, you want to understand coincidence if a, uh, a gravitational wave passes through one and then passes through the other, you know how far they are apart and you know how long that uh, ought to take and you can really have a chance of finding the needle in the proverbial haystack mm -hmm. of these very, very small signals. So uh, the experiment has been in the making for uh, several decades, fantastic support from the federal government, even though this is an incredibly challenging experiment to undertake and I applaud uh, the citizens of the United States for supporting this uh, this really heroic endeavor, which I think is as much part of culture as it is a part of, uh, of uh, technology and science. So the experiment goes like this. You have to detect this wave coming through. What does the wave do? Well, it changes the shape of space and time, but it does so at a very small level. And just to give you a sense of the smallness of the changes that have to be detected, let me ask you to look at your pinky, look at your little finger mm -hmm. and ask how broad is the nail? Well, roughly speaking, it's about a centimeter across, mm -hmm. something like that. Now shrink down by about eight powers of 10, so about 100 million, and that gets you to about the size of an atom. Not enough. Now go down by another eight powers of 10. That gets you to about the size uh, uh, of a nucleus of an atom, but smaller, about a thousandth of the size of the nucleus of an atom. And that is the distance or change in separation between the detectors of the experiment in an evacuated tube about four kilometers long, one in uh, Louisiana, one in Washington, mm -hmm. that needed to be detected. Quite a challenge. I'm told that it's as if we knew the distance from Earth to the nearest star to within the thickness of a human hair. No. I haven't checked that calculation, but it sounds about <laughs> right to me. Qu quite a challenge, and this nevertheless was accomplished. Not only was it accomplished, but it was accomplished the day after the experiment was turned on. So no. 20 years in the making, and it's as if nature had conspired to send us this perfect signal. Just waiting for us to build exactly. these uh, instruments. Are you ready, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> so to give you a sense of scale, the gravitational event, the merger of two black holes that was uh, detected um, about two and a half years ago, and that wave has been propagating through space, waiting <laughs> and arriving here uh, at, in, at, uh, at Earth to be detected. Now, since then, and we say in science sometimes, yesterday's sensation, today's calibration, <laughs> that uh, event uh, is one of several that have now been and now been detected. Mm -hmm. It's a raining black hole mergers out there. Yeah. <laughs> and the most recent event, um, another truly stunning event, much closer to uh, Earth, uh, was the signature of the collision, not now of two black holes, but of two neutron stars. And that particular celestial collision would result in another major breakthrough for College of Science researchers. That along with Paul Goldbart's vision for the future of the College of Sciences, is coming up in part two of this audio story. I'm Renee San Miguel with the Georgia Tech College of Sciences. <laughs>